Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this um, web conference uh, sponsored by RX360 that will cover cargo theft in high-risk areas. Welcome to everybody who joined us today. Thanks for being on. My name is Lee Nagao. I work with the Secretariat for RX360, and I'll just be taking everyone through a few logistics before we introduce our speakers for today. Um, everyone should be uh, seeing their screen now, which should show a, um, just some in, uh, instructions for how people can interact with their um, GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Um, if you'd uh, like to ask a question, you can just press the raise hand icon there, which is um, shown in point number two. Um, we will unmute your lines when we see that you're raising your hand. For, for the full presentation, we'll keep the lines muted. And then at the end, we'll have an open question and answer session. So um, the reason we're keeping the lines muted is just to make sure that we don't get feedback or other noises during the presentation. Um, during the webinar, of course, you are always welcome to type in questions. Again, we will save those questions for the end of the session. And um, definitely, if we don't get to all the written-in questions, um, or if you wanted to ask a question we simply didn't have time, um, please write in your questions, and uh, we will record all those. And uh, we can get back to you on, on those questions later. OK, I see that we have um, a large number of people on the phone. We did have, actually, um, a good number of people showing up today, or at least registered for today. Um, so I'm just going to, oh, and the other thing, too, that um, I wanted to uh, tell you is that we will be recording the session as well. And as we have done with all our other uh, supply chain security webinars, um, these recordings will be posted uh, on our website for others to, to see and to, um, to use. Okay, so I'm just going to take us down to the uh, next slide. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce our speakers for today. Um, our speakers uh, are going to be Amy Embroidno, uh, who is with Amgen and is, and is a project coordinator uh, in operations risk management. She has been the working group leader for this cargo theft group. Uh, she will be joined in this presentation by Brad Elrod, who is director of global conveyance security at Pfizer, also a very active member of this group, as well as our um, previous cargo theft uh, um, also introducing and um, giving background on uh, the various, uh, on this working group and a little bit about RX360 will be Tim Valco, who is the co-chair of the Supply Chain Security uh, uh, Steering Committee within RX360. And Tim is with Amgen and he is Executive Director of Global Supply Chain. Okay, so um, maybe I'll hand things off to Tim without any further ado. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, and thank you all for uh, participating in this uh, webinar this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you're located. As Lee said, I'm uh, sponsoring this working group, and this team originated uh, about four months ago when we were soliciting topics for the next areas that we wanted to focus. Uh, and if you've done business in uh, Italy or Mexico, you'll know that the threat of violent cargo theft has seen a significant increase in the uh, recent past. And this paper is addressing, uh, the intention of the paper is to address how companies are um, dealing with this risk, uh, mitigation actions that they can take, and just to share some of the experiences that they have had. So with that, um, as Lee said, Amy, works here at Amgen in the supply chain security team and will bring uh, her experience and our experience at Amgen uh, to the paper. And Brad Elrod is the director of global conveyance security at Pfizer and Brad's been an active member of the supply chain security team for uh, a few years now. So thanks to both of you and thanks to the team for uh, preparing this material. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks Tim. Next slide, Lee. So here is a list of the um, members of our working group. Um, 
several of them were on the call today. Um, I want to thank them for all their participation and input. Next slide. So as Tim said, our group was formed due to the increasing concerns by member companies with the escalation of violent cargo theft incidents in geographical areas categorized as high risk. Compounding the problem is the bureaucratic theft reporting process, the low probability that crimes will be pro properly categorized and investigated, and the negative publicity associated with the crimes that cause these types of incidents to go unreported. Global trends of increasing cargo theft correlate with increasing patient safety risk. As we all know, one of the biggest fears is that stolen product can be inappropriately handled and re-enter into the supply chain. The purpose of our paper is to summarize issues that member companies are experiencing in certain high-risk areas, specifically Mexico and Italy for this paper, and to outline some risk mitigation strategies that are currently being considered or implemented um, which we provide in a risk mitigation options uh, matrix. This matrix describes potential risk mitigation elements, their benefits, costs, and how they are currently being used in Italy and Mexico by our member companies. So the information in our paper and our matrix is based on member companies' firsthand experiences and industry association information and data. I will now turn it over to Brad, and he is going to walk you through the uh, rest of the paper and the matrix. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and actually, Lee, if you just click through a little bit there, you'll see the other slides. The, um, in Italy, one of the things that we wanted to do and uh, was pick a country that we knew was having some problems and where the threat of uh, violence was high. Here, we've seen an increasing uh, report of incidents, and while we did this paper last, uh, last year, uh, in the interim, since we finished writing this paper, it seems that the threat has even uh, evolved a little further and, and gotten even more intense inside of Italy. Um, what we have, one of the, one of the possibilities that we've noted is some of the earlier thefts were uh, very random and uh, were targeting uh, just targeting theft. It was a theft, and when they found out what they were could get and what they could do with it, they were finding. Uh, a better market, and then it has since become a little more organized, and, and the efforts have become a little more targeted on some of our shipments. Um, Italy poses a very uh, interesting situation. Uh, it's a very organized criminal environment, uh, and it uh, law enforcement has shown some reluctance in, in order to be in, to be involved here. Reluctance, not because they don't want to help; it's just they're not sure where to go. They don't have the resources in in many cases. And quite frankly, sometimes the criminal is much more involved, they're much more organized than uh, the law enforcement in certain parts of, of Italy. Um, the methods of delivery are also uh, much more integrated than they are in some other parts of the world, so that when they hit a truck, they're generally not hitting just one company. It's a multitude of companies. So while any one theft for a company may be a little bit smaller, um, sometimes they're still significant. The, the, the industry uh, impact is is still fairly large. And you'll see that. And it's, it's much more of a sort of hub and spoke type of distribution system. Uh, they, they're, a few warehouses are working as distribution centers, sending out a mixed load of material uh, for, for relatively extended distances where it hits a local distribution uh, network. And it causes, on the full truck load side, to be a very um, a large shipment. Um, but where a lot of the theft has happened has been on what we would consider last mile carrier type of deliveries in the U.S. Um, the threat of violence uh, is also, uh, and threat of force is, is very prevalent. Um, and there's also a consideration of collusion uh, is a prime consideration with drivers uh, for one reason or another, not necessarily voluntarily uh, just helping out, but they are being you know, threatened or their families threatened if they don't help out. Um, in Mexico, uh, Mexico has uh, been a perpetual uh, uh, location for, for incidents uh, over the, the, as long as I've been involved in cargo theft issues. Uh, it has seemed to be um, getting a little more uh, a resurgence in Mexico over the last uh, year or two, uh, on pharmaceuticals in particular. Uh, again, very organized nature of the crime. Uh, it's it, this case is mostly drug cartels, um, 
and they are they they have a say or at least a controlling factor in nearly all the events of the criminal nature in Mexico. Uh, different factions uh, cause it to be an even because you have multiple competing cartels. Uh, it sometimes makes it a little bit more confusing and, and in some cases more dangerous because they will shoot at each other as quickly sometimes as they will shoot at uh, innocent bystanders or law enforcement or the truck driver or anybody else. Uh, violent force is, is, is commonly an issue. Uh, law enforcement corruption has also been a, a big issue in Mexico. Not so much in the major areas or Mexico City, but once you're out into the countryside, so to speak, the smaller law enforcement they're either controlled by drug cartels, they're threatened by drug cartels. Uh, these guys do not make a lot of money. This is a way for them to support their families. And so you see a lot of law enforcement corruption out and away from that. Mexican government has been making a fairly, a fairly strong uh, uh, drive to police the police, if you will. Uh, but it, it's, it's not quite there yet. And then there's just the, the sophistication of the gangs and the use of technology. Jamming devices have been used uh, extensively, uh, and tracking devices by the criminals have been used. They'll they'll spot a truck leaving one location. They'll they'll put a, a, a tracking device on the on the vehicle itself, follow it at times uh, from a distance, so that if there are escorts, escorts sometimes go for a certain distance and then drop off or. It just gives them a sense of uh, being uh, false confidence of, and lulls them into that sense of false confidence. You let the guard down a little bit, and then they can just pounce upon that truck at some other location where there's less, you know, uh, ability for them to get help and assistance in a timely manner. Okay, next slide. So Italy and the situation there is um, again a severe threat, and multiple methods have been used, and we'll talk about them a little bit as we go through. Robberies. Robberies is, you know, taking goods by force or intimidation. That's when you're actually confronting some people. That works. Burglaries, uh, you know, breaking into facilities and into warehouses. That's happened occasionally. And hijacking is just uh, frequently armed and, and they do employ violence and they're just taking trucks off the road. They're doing it at gunpoint. They use roadblocks in some case, sometimes posing as police. That has happened in the past six months. Uh, and one of the things that we've been seeing an increase here of these fictitious pickups, false, uh, showing up with false documents, license plates, uh, just the brokerage process by which drivers are sometimes uh, selected and put into jobs. Uh, you know, you can you. It's just a confusing process. Um, sometimes the drivers themselves is falsely reported cargo theft because they're part of the process. Uh, collusion, as I talked about earlier. Uh, use of force is frequent. Uh, at this point, uh, there have been very few. It's been more the threat of force than uh, the actual application um, in, in, in Italy. But uh, that threat of force is real. It's not uh, there. And then uh, inside collusion with thieves, and they defeat the security system. Somebody in the warehouse is involved. Somebody's feeding information to an organization somewhere. Somebody is turning off security systems uh, so that people can get into warehouses. Uh, it's just it's a it's a rampant problem, and the data shows. I mean, although this data is a little bit uh, a little bit dated, it goes back to 2012. We haven't got all of 2013. This is from TAPA, which is a Transported Asset Protection Association, and this is the European, Middle East, and Africa uh, chapter uh, that collected this information. So it's just it is an EMEA doc uh, information. You can see just the overall number of cargo thefts jumped up significantly in 2012. And that number, for the, to the best that I know, has gone up even higher in 2013. The second slide, our second um, graph here, shows the various uh, commodities that have been targeted. Consumer electronics uh, remains one of the largest. What is interesting is that uh, the pharmaceutical thefts that are shown on here all happened within 2012. Not that there weren't others before, they just weren't being reported. And that's sort of been a trend inside of Europe uh, and uh, the EU in general. Uh, pharma had not been actively reporting a lot of these. Pharma, uh, the pharma companies had not been uh, major players in the TAPA uh, organization, and they have in the past few years joined uh, in, in the European theater. And so they started getting reports they weren't getting before. But if you look at that, the number of thefts of pharmaceuticals in just 2012 alone is bigger than any other theft in 2012. So it's it's um, 
a dangerous situation, and, and it's a growing concern inside of Europe. And Italy has been the hotbed by a, a, almost a factor of four or five larger than the next largest com, uh, country. And in most cases, it's, it far exceeds other countries in Europe. OK, next slide, please. So in Mexico, what, are we, what is the situation we're facing there? Again, as I mentioned earlier, a severe threat of violence, uh, and, and it is often a violent thing. Uh, organized criminal groups uh, are very organized. They're well-funded, and they're well-equipped. They're well-armed. In most cases, the criminal organizations are better armed than the police and law enforcement and those people responding to them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later on about armed guards and what good that is or isn't. But one of the problems with armed uh, escorts and armed guards in Mexico is, in particular is that because of the laws, you almost have to be part of the police in order to legally have an armed guard on, on there. Um, they also have a lot of knowledge in how to defeat protective measures. I already talked about jamming devices. They know the locks and seals are, you know, a wise man once told me, locks are there to keep your friends out, and that is no, no uh, secret here to these guys. The GPS system, and even the security guards, they, they'll, uh, you know, I've seen uh, clips where these guys get cut off in traffic, intentionally cut off, not just, you know, because traffic got heavy. The criminal element is using the traffic to help block them and divert them from where the actual load is, and then they'll reroute the load so that they can't figure out where they're at. Distribution centers in Mexico, and Mexico City in particular, have been targeted because there are a certain number of those that people know are holding uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, again, it's just part of the, the way we're there. There have been times where the, these gangs, these cartels, have blocked off entire sections of highway. They'll let the, the target uh, pass by a certain location, then they'll block the road. And so they know no one's going to be able to come up behind them. And when I say block the lo road, they're, they're going to roll boulders uh, turn trucks over sideways or turn them sideways and abandon them, take the keys, whatever. They're going to block it off, and then they will segregate the thing. Uh, you know, the great train robberies of the world uh, may have may be the things of Hollywood today, but they do actually still happen in, in Mexico. Uh, pharmaceuticals are not always their biggest target here because not a lot of pharmaceuticals ship by freight train. But just, the point of, of leaving that in here is that it just shows the brazen attitude of these guys. They will block off the train track and basically force the train to stop in a very remote region where there are no roads, so you can't get to it very easily anyway. Um, and then they'll take whatever they want off the train, and they sort of have their own, you know, no time constraints to do it, or, you know, pretty long time constraints anyway. Okay. Um, and then, again, uh, law enforcement as either incapable, and that I don't necessarily mean incompetent, I just mean they just do not have the resources in a lot of the, the country to, to deal with this, at the same time fighting the drug wars that they have going on. Or, as I mentioned earlier, they're participating in the theft themselves. Uh, and that is, is not an uncommon issue inside of, uh, or, of Mexico, outside of the Mexico City area, and outside of the major metropolitan areas. Uh, the smaller towns, the, the rural roads, uh, backcountry roads, uh, the police that enforce that portion of the country are just as easily to be overcome and, and controlled by these organized drug cartels as they are anything else. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, and if you click it just one more time, please. Uh, thank you. So you can see down here on this loss, uh, in the, the data from Mexico, this is coming from Freight Watch. Again, they have better data than, than a lot of people in Mexico. There are other organizations. But for the information that Freight Watch International has, uh, has uh, collected here, you can see that pharmaceuticals in 2011 were, have it, had an average loss value of under $10,000 U.S. Uh, in 2012, it jumped significantly. So that's an average loss per event. Um, what that would indicate is that the, uh, the criminal element has found a way to target better what they're going after. Uh, they're no longer just going after vitamins and aspirin. They're going after prescription medications. Uh, and, and if anyone here has done business in Mexico, you'll know that a $300,000 shipment in Mexico is a large shipment of pharmaceuticals. Um, 
just by the nature of how we move things. I know for us how we move things and how other people do. Um, again, the, the, the number of pharmaceutical thefts versus other thefts in Mexico may not look like it as much, uh, but it is, it is growing. Uh, the point is, is anything is eligible to be stolen in Mexico. Uh, some things move a lot easier, food and drinks. Uh, consumer care products, uh, cash obviously is always good, tobacco products, alcohol products, those types of things move easily um, because people will buy them from anybody on the street uh, and that's, that's part of the problem in Mexico. Okay, next slide. Okay, that, that, these next few slides are going to be a little confusing and I'm not going to go over in full detail because this is part of the risk mitigation uh, or the mitigation options matrix that we, uh, we came together as a team and developed. Uh, and I had to split them apart because of the, the width of them. But you can see that in the, uh, these were some suggestions or elements that we thought would be things to consider as how to mitigate a problem along the left side of this and a little bit of description of what it means. So if you look at, uh, and we, again, we will go through each and every one of these, but if you look at armed escorts even, uh, we talk a little bit about what that means, and then you get in here, it, uh, the benefit is it adds a layer of security. Um, but it's an expensive option. It costs you, you know, depending on the amount of shipping you're doing and the level of uh, armed escorts you're using, you know, you easily can be spending a million dollars a year on just escorts. Uh, next slide, please. Now again, continuing along that cost of mitigation, the risk here, however, is that there's a, a, a if you put armed escorts on a vehicle or following a vehicle, uh, you're increasing uh, the risk of harm dramatically. The reason for that is once firearms are present, they don't do anybody any good unless you pull them and use them. Um, they, you, there's a good argument to be said they don't do anybody any good if you pull them and use them as well. Uh, but that's a philosophy class that we can talk about some other time. But in, in this particular case, the, the issue is that, you know, you're hiring these guys to protect it. The problem is, is they're only carrying small arms at best. They're sidearms, maybe rifles, and these other guys are going to pull out much bigger weapons and much more powerful weapons and more of them. You know, you got an escort vehicle, at best you may have one guy in the car, two escort vehicles, at best with two guys in each. You may have an armed squad of five men to protect this load, and they're going to come at you with 15 or 20. It's just the numbers are, are, are appalling. It is a common use in Mexico. This is not a common issue in Italy. And again, it has a lot to do with the laws and how they're applied and what the, the difficulty in getting armed escorts are and what the threat has been in the past. Again, but you can see we also go down, we talk about, you know, sub contractor audits and self-assessments, convoy driving, what the use of that is, unmarked delivery trucks, and, and those are the different types of things we talk about. So this, this uh, flip one more page, please. Um, then we talk about preferred drivers lists and what that means, you know, knowing who the driver is picking up. And again, we just, these are different common practices for you to consider. Uh, dedicated deliveries versus or for secondary lanes, making sure you have very controlled processes, contract incentives and penalties. Do you build in all of these security requirements into your contract and hold them accountable for it to, for your trans excuse me for your transporters? Uh, using of toll roads and daytime shipments only. Again, we're looking at ways to re alleviate some of the threat that's out there. GPS monitoring, again, tracking devices becomes a little bit more cost in intensive and you have a control issue to think about. And then just following some, uh, in this case, uh, TAPA best practices. TAPA has a transportation uh, security requirements document. It's available to members and, quite frankly, I think it's available to anybody. It's some good practices that were put together over the last uh, few years on how to improve the security. Uh, next slide. Again, this is just the other half of that same list. So in reality, what you just saw on four pages is two pages of a matrix showing you some of the pros and cons of multiple elements of security uh, considerations uh, that you can have and should you know, consider as you're putting into play with uh, your shipping inside of these regions, both in Mexico and Italy. And we tried to make this a, a useful document for people just to you know, understand what some people are doing and what some of the pros and cons 
uh, the pluses and minuses, if you will, of those those actions would be. Uh, I believe that's it for me. Uh, Amy? Thanks, Brad. So I just wanted to let everybody on the line know that it was approved by the um, Supply Chain Security Steering Committee that this group is going to continue on throughout 2014 as a discussion group. We're going to meet once a month uh, to continue collaborating, um, see what else is out there that you know, member companies could maybe take advantage to help mitigate some of these risks. Um, we're soliciting nominations for membership. If anyone would like someone from their company to join the team, please let myself or um, the Secretariat office uh, know. And uh, we're going to be starting up the meetings um, either later this month or early next month, as soon as we can get that pulled together. So I think um, that's all for the review of the paper. I'll turn it back over to Lee to facilitate some uh, Q&A. Great. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Brad and Tim. OK, so um, let's see now. We're about, um, I guess we're at the bottom of the hour here. And um, that leaves us a good amount of time for questions and discussion. So we really um, encourage you to ask any questions. Um, I do have a couple of comments here from, um, from Ed Kinkler, who is a member of uh, the working group. And um, I'm just going to unmute his line here. So. So Ed, I think you're unmuted now. Yeah, I'm. I'm on now, Lee. But I, I believe that. But I received a couple of your comments, and I'm wondering yeah. if you wanted to. Yeah, I was just basically going back over what, what Brad was saying on on some of these things. Um, but what I did did want to mention is, um, you know, as we were wrapping up this paper, and since the writing of the paper, a significant uh, number of reports have surfaced already which basically confirmed our choice of uh, Mexico and Italy for our, for our case study. Um, you know, and also, you know, some of it being increased tensions in, in areas like the Michoacan region in, in Mexico, which, you know, has caused uh, self armed self-defense groups to take to the streets uh, to, uh, you know, due to the lack of uh, the government's ability to, do, you know, to, uh, protect them but the problem is is you know that causes you know our, our freight that's moving to stop and if you're familiar with that region there's a big port there that, that uh, uh, brings in product you know from China and uh, places you know from from the West and there's a lot of freight moving through there and and that just increases the uh, uh, you know the, the chance of an incident to happen where you know, trucks can be taken and things of that nature. Thanks, Ed. I think we had another question from um, a person from Merck Group, uh, Hardy Zanderson. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, the actual written question didn't come through, but it looks like you have one. If uh, let me just have to get one here. Hardy, are you still with us? Yes, I'm with you. No, I, I didn't have a question. I just uh, tried to, to get in uh, into the conversation, but I don't have a question right now. Oh, OK. Thank you. Lee, this is Brad. I, I would also put out there, as we expand this, we you know continue this group, um, you know, you, you heard Amy's uh, request for people if you want to be joining. We, we focused on Italy and Mexico really to make this a manageable project in the beginning. Uh, we're not necessarily looking to stay focused just on those two regions. Obviously, I mean, any anybody that's been involved in this in the past can rattle off five or six other countries as I could uh, that are uh, immediate problems and everybody knows about them. Uh, but so we're, we're not necessarily looking at a given region to be just, uh, we looked here because these were some that have been and would continue to be uh, high risk areas. Uh, there have been a lot of incidents happening, uh, so please don't don't think that we're trying to limit ourselves just to Mexico or Italy in our, in our discussion. Great, thanks, Brad. Uh, I did receive a couple more questions here. One is, can we receive soft copies of the presentation? And yes, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be posting these on the website, but um, if people want, we can certainly just send those directly to you as well um, in the email. 
Uh, let's see. So here's a question. Um, can retailers like Target, for example, join the group as well? Um, that's an interesting question. So um, the, the way RX360 works is basically if there are um, experts, specific experts outside of the membership of RX360, who the working group feels um, are needed, you know, to add to the discussion, um, then those experts can be invited, and certainly those experts can come from um, various industries and so forth. Um, and we have had that um, that precedence before it within our three sixty working groups. Um, another question is. Um, Looking at Italy and Mexico, is it all over the country, or do we know of certain regions within these countries um, where risks are higher or where incidents are happening more frequently? Uh, Lee, I can answer that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, within, uh, and I'm just going from these last couple of reports, uh, we had a carrier truck in Afragola in Napoli, uh, Modagno in Bari and Prado in Tuscany, and uh, let's see, Canosa di Puglia, and they, I did have a list uh, where we have it, uh, one of the ports, I would, I would have to get back to you on that, I don't have that in the chart or anything of that nature, but uh, they, they said, uh, I guess the area of Milan is is hot also. These are these are just some of the reports that, that you know we've been getting. Right. I, w I would agree with that. I mean, it it's it's it is a diverse number of of locations where we've had incidences noted uh, that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are those that I'm certainly not aware of. Uh, but we do tend to find that south of Rome much more opportune location for these, these events to happen. In Mexico, uh, Mexico City and the, the, the greater surrounding Mexico City, the state of Mexico City, uh, always a high target. Ports are high targets and points of uh, uh, are also Laredo. outside Mexico City are all areas because these are all the trans you know Mexico if you look at it it's um, like Latin, so got certain hubs, but Mexico may be more than other than others because Mexico City is such a huge center of business almost everything ends up going to Mexico City and so these guys can target the roads in and out of Mexico City and, and cuts down the amount of logistics for for them. Yeah, Brad, one of the biggest hot spots in Mexico has uh, historically been the, the road from uh, Nuevo Laredo in Tamaulipas uh, going into Monterrey it's, it, you know, with the MO of uh, fake law enforcement or fake military setting up roadblocks and, and taking, taking what they need. It's usually targeted freight. Yeah, and, and, and and, and again, if you think about where those districts are in Mexico, those are some of the most hotly contested cartel locations uh, as well. So it, again, it, it is a good point. I mean, it would be great if we could say this is the place it happens, but as soon as you start protecting one place, the criminals are smart. They're going to pick up and move to some place where there's less protection and less awareness. Uh, so what's, what's hot today and what has been hot in the past will shift over time as you protect against it. And, and the best the, the best defense I can think, and please agree or disagree, is that you just try to have to watch where those trends are and and have the process. It's not it's not the exact answer any one place. It's a process to review, implement, and adjust as the threat you know uh, arises. It really is that risk matrix. And it sort of goes back to an earlier discussion or earlier paper that we did with this group. Uh, is the the, the the risk mitigation that you have is really varied based on different problems in different regions 
and even different times of the year. You know, they, these guys have Christmas shopping season just like everybody else, and they, they, they will pick up activities at certain parts of the year. Brad, I think what also plays into that is what local authorities allow and, and don't allow, what the, the local laws are. Right, and that, yeah, and that, and that goes back to the, uh, the, not only just the actual legitimate laws, but what law enforcement in certain regions can do and will do, which yep. are not necessarily uh, in line with each other all the time. Okay. Any other comments on that from the members? Okay, here's another question. Um, this one says, uh, we see penalties for cargo theft in the U.S. to create a low risk, high reward. Are the penalties in, in Italy and Mexico stringent enough? If so, are they enforced? <clears throat> I, uh, again, this is Brad and, and those others of you that have been involved with it, please join in. Generally speaking, no. Uh, the penalties, and if, 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 even if there are good penalties, they're, they're hard to enforce. Um, you know, putting a, 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 a high penalty on a driver is almost useless because he's not going to be able to pay it. That guy's going to jail at best. The, the, but the hope is, is it does become a discouraging issue for larger organized uh, elements. But the, the reality of the world is that it is very, very hard to enforce uh, in parts of the world, especially in some of these parts. Okay. Another question is, if we're not a member company, who would we reach out to if we are interested in participating in this group? Um, so you can certainly reach out to the Secretariat for ARC360, and you can do that through the website, um, or um, simply by sending um, the, uh, I'm not sure if you have DD or Alexis's emails, but probably through the website right now is the best way to do that. Um, and that'll go to a number of us within the Secretariat, and we can get right back to you on that. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, members, um, once you're a member, um, all members have the ability to join all the, all the various ARC360 working groups. Um, and we also have an observer level of um, participants as well who are not um, full members. They don't particularly participate in working groups, although, as I said, in particular instances, there's a need for um, a particular expertise um, that the working groups need, they will reach out to the observers. Um, observer organizations um, to get that expertise, or if there's particular liaisons that um, would be good to make, we, we do that through the through our observer functions as well. Um, so those are two different tiers of, of participation in, in ARC 360. Okay, let's see. Oh, here's another question. Um, okay. Um, as a logistics service provider, how do we partner with the procurement groups to enhance their understanding of security risks to influence consideration of value car carriers versus least cost service providers for movements of controlled substances, both with dedicated or FTL or even in the LTL world? That is so the question was really about how do you get your internally, your transportation group and your procurement group working together? That's the first part of the question, I believe. And I am going to, hold on, I'm just, I'm unmuting Jay Blanton's phone. Jay Blanton from UPS. Uh, perhaps if you want to talk about this question further. Jay, are you with us? I am. Yeah, so just, I guess the, the question there is, is that's one of the challenges as a logistics service provider that we have is that there's always that, that challenge between uh, when we're talking with, uh, you know, customers and whatnot, uh, we start talking about, um, you know, costs when it comes to carriers and whatnot, and oftentimes when we deal with the procurement departments of our customers, um, the focus is always on the lowest cost service provider, um, and those departments typically do not understand security risk 
um, or even the, the cargo theft risk in, in many cases uh, based on our experience. Um, and they're making decisions based on the least cost versus the value carriers, carriers that are proven to have existing procedures and protocols in place that would reduce or prevent the cargo thefts. And, and, and also even in the LTL world as well. Obviously we understand there's better LTL carriers than, uh, than others and better full truckload carriers than others as well, but it always seems to go back to cost. Yeah, I, this is Brad. I, 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 I can sympathize, empathize with your position. I, I, I understand what you're saying because it is, it's even internally that sometimes is a cost. For, as a security professional working in the logistics world, yeah, in this day and age, everybody's fighting the dollar and trying to save it. And, and I, I can appreciate that. I think it really kind of goes to the heart of what RX360 has tried to do is that the cost of a cargo theft, and one of the things we've been trying to work on, maybe it's another working group uh, down the road for us, but one of the things that we've been trying to, to show is that the cost of a loss is not merely the value of the product that was on that truck. Because there's a, a whole litany of other things that have to go into it. You, you've now threatened a recall. You've, you've, you've got product uh, viability, uh, corporate image, uh, and, and all of which is important. On top of which, and not to at all minimize, but uh, patient safety, if, if we want to make that, I don't think there's a, a pharmaceutical company out here that will ever uh, say that patient safety is not an important part of what we're doing. You know, if you look at the bottom of this, our slides here, protecting patients worldwide, that's, that is, you know, that's an important part of how we do business. And I think what it becomes is showing that what you're doing is providing more than simple insurance on a lost product. You're, you're protecting uh, the integrity of the product, patient safety, corporate rep reputation, uh, and, and a, a whole list of things. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, and, and frankly, I don't know of anybody in this industry that's not struggling to try to, to show what that really is today. But that's the important part of this discussion is, is showing that the, the, the value of cargo uh, security, cargo integrity, and, and, and overall security of supply chain is not simply the cost of the goods lost. As a matter of fact, that's, you know, as, as we look at it, that is probably one of the smaller pieces of the puzzle. Because at the end of the day, if you have to recall the lot that this material was stolen from, you may be recalling a whole lot more uh, than, than what you lost. And you may be, you know, now you're representing your company is having to make a recall, even though it's no fault of your own. You know, the the bad guys are nameless. The company doing the recall is not, and, and so those are all things to consider. Uh, as a provider, that may not help you a lot, but as a you know, making sure that you're helping to present that argument with the people who are responsible for the movement of material and responsible for the security of that material will probably be how I would approach it if I were you, and that was, I think, is a direction that a lot of companies could go. But it really, it, it is an ongoing problem. I, I As I said, I, I sympathize and empathize with your position, uh, but it is one that it, it's just the reality of the world that cost is king, and, and we got to figure out a way to, to make people think beyond the, the, the immediate dollar value. Um, because, you know, they're, they're going to squeeze a, a carrier to, to cut costs you know, they, 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 they'll, they'll save a dollar a pound or, you know, we'll make up the whatever the right number is, uh, but it'll cost them 10 on the back side if they're not careful. Sure, and, and just, you know, we've had experiences with customers where we, we've got the procurement in the room or and the customer security uh, uh, reps in the room and, you know, there's, there's an issue and one person says, oh, we're going to the lowest cost service provider. We're not aware of having any issues, and then the, the security resource in the room says, "Well, that's our seventh loss this year." So, just as an industry or whatever, it seems like that would be an opportunity for, um, you know, if, if we're looking to really address, you know, the cargo theft and whatnot, that would be an opportunity to work with the procurement departments um, within the healthcare sector, I guess. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, I think too, when you start to point out that you know the FDA is pressing companies to do a better job with this, is is you know is key. You know, the, the, the secure supply chain program that they're putting in place is, one, is not really a cargo theft issue, but it is a, it's a program, again, to enhance the security, and there's a business benefit to people being involved with that. And, and 
it's just really a matter of how you present uh, the topic and to make sure that it is heard correctly because when it comes down to you know if you got somebody that their their job in life is to cut costs they're going to do that uh, but if your job in life is to protect the product then you know you have the same responsibility to stand up and do that too inside of your companies yeah Brad this is Tim I'd also like to add that you know from a procurement standpoint it's good to get the right level of leaders in the room when you're having that conversation so that they're aware because it is difficult to put a price on product integrity and patient safety but I agree it's hard to quantify that so I think to me and definitely within the working group uh, participants the the focus is on patient safety so our companies have already made that commitment that you go to whatever level you need to that's practical to be able to address the risk I do think there's a lack of awareness uh, for companies that just don't have a more advanced supply chain security uh, organization so it's a great point and uh, we'll, we'll look for ways to help in that awareness space Great, great discussion and very good questions. Um, here's another question from Susan Griggs at Lilly. I've just unmuted your line, Susan. Yeah, hi. Um, just a follow-up comment on the previous discussion about return on investment. Um, you know, Brad, you were at PCSC last week. Um, there's just a common theme as, as I talk to different security managers of these different companies. We're all struggling to produce ROIs. Um, University of Texas, uh, Freight Watch and University of Texas are putting together a project to identify or at least make a good estimate of what the real, co what the real cost of a loss is in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. That's a project that they're putting a charter together for right now and, and probably within the next couple of months they'll have a written project charter for that. So that would give us one piece of the equation. I know that I struggled to do an ROI for Lilly. Uh, to implement the TAPA standards to understand the cost of that. I was able to get one finished, but I think we, whether it's sponsored by RX360 or TAPA or whoever would, would come together, I really think we should do a couple of example ROIs uh, for the pharmaceutical industry and get that out to some of our members because we're all, it seems like everyone I talk to is struggling with that same thing. I, I talked with a gentleman from uh, University of Texas at that meeting last week, too, Susan, and, and it's, right, it's one that has to be addressed, and it's one that I'm... Hey, Brad, you're sort of... I, I'm sorry, I just echo those comments. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, you're just sort of fading out there for a minute. And uh, the RAND Corporation has done some... I talked to... Uh, Dan Pertel last week also from uh, BSI, he said the RAND Corporation has done some work on this as well. So I, you know, I think it behooves all of, I mean, if we can get a few core people together in the next, you know, th uh, make it a goal for this year to produce at least some sort of guidelines on how do you do an ROI? How does the typical supply, cha supply chain security manager go about doing an ROI? I think it would be tremendously helpful to, I mean, it would be for me because I struggled with it. I got it done, but I really struggled with it. So if you're interested in helping with any of that, I, I think even if we just pull half a dozen of us together and get that done, then the next year would be great. That's great. Thanks, Susan. Any other comments from our members? Okay. I'm just looking through our list here. I don't see any other raised hands or questions. No other written in questions. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Let me just make sure I don't miss anybody here because we've had a little bit of time left. Okay, yeah, I think that's it for questions. As I said, um, certainly um, feel free to contact um, any of uh, our members through our um, through the RX360 website. You can just um, be in contact with um, the Secretariat's office, and we're happy to forward questions or provide more information if you um, do have those follow-up questions or comments. Um, 
again, uh, we will send out these slides to people as well as post them on the uh, on the website. So we, um, you know, we welcome your perusal of the website. If you haven't done that yet, um, please do. There's a lot of information, especially on um, supply chain security issues. We have all of our previous white papers and tools up on the site, um, which are uh, free for everyone to use. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for joining us today and thank you to our presenters for today. Um, great job and of course to all of you for listening in and also asking some really great questions. Um, we welcome uh, you to all of our uh, future web conferences. There will be um, a few more this year uh, focusing on um, supply chain security issues, um, so watch out for those. Uh, we'll be sending out our usual um, flash reports uh, when those become available. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye.